My name is Ari Redboard. I am head of legal and government affairs at TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software. Welcome to TRM Talks. TRM Talks is a monthly discussion with policymakers and business leaders in the cryptocurrency space. In the age of the internet, a hack meant the loss of valuable PII. In the age of crypto, a cyber attack could mean the loss of life savings or a threat to critical infrastructure. On July 15th, the Secretary of Homeland Security said, quote, as ransomware attacks continue to rise around the world, businesses and other organizations must prioritize their cybersecurity. Cyber criminals have targeted critical infrastructure, small businesses, hospitals, police departments, schools, and more. These attacks directly impact Americans' daily lives and the security of our nation, end quote. The White House has stressed the need to work with international partners and the private sector in order to defeat a borderless enemy. And the FBI director has compared the threat to 9-11. As the battlefield moves online and illicit actors in rogue nation states engage in cyber attacks and programmatic money laundering at unprecedented speed and scale, law enforcement and the private sector are moving to coordinate defensive and offensive responses to this emerging threat. TRM Talks has assembled a public-private lineup of those on the front lines to discuss cyber attacks in the age of crypto. Carol House, Director of Cybersecurity for the NSC. Ken Schaefer, National Program Manager for the Cyber Financial Group at Homeland Security Investigations. Tom Hoffman, Senior Vice President of Intelligence at Flashpoint. And Lisa Soto, who chairs the cybersecurity practice at Hunton, Andrews, and Kurth. Thank you all so much for joining uh, us today. I feel like this is truly sort of the the lineup, the all-star team that we uh, would want to assemble to talk about this issue. So really honored that you are able to join TRM Talks today. Before uh, diving right into the work uh, that you guys are all doing across the space, uh, if you would talk a little bit about uh, your journey to cryptocurrency to uh, cyber attacks to ransomware, sort of the topics we're going to be discussing today. Uh, Carol, I'd love to kick things off with you. Absolutely. Thanks, Ari. And and thanks very much to TRM Labs for for letting me join you all today for this fantastic panel. Um, My my background has been a little bit of a patchwork quilt of different national security issues uh, that's led me here. Uh, I was in the Army and I served in chemical defense uh, as well as as an intelligence collection manager, managing all the assets that watch and listen to people in support of our operations. Um, when I left, I ended up working for the Office of Management and Budgets uh, cybersecurity unit that they were standing up to help oversee the cybersecurity posture of federal civilian agencies and working with, um, with agencies like DHS to help secure the .gov domain space. Um, after that, I spent time with Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs supporting cybersecurity, critical infrastructure, and supply chain issues. And then finally, I did a detail over at FinCEN, uh, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, the primary regulator for anti-money laundering and fell in love with the mission set. Uh, so I moved over there to work on cryptocurrency crime and cyber crime issues. Um, re- very recently, I was asked to join the NSC um, and lead our efforts on countering ransomware and policy approaches to digital identity and digital assets. Terrific, Carol. We, we might get to this uh, you know, in a moment. Uh, quite frankly, I, I was lucky enough to work with you when you were at FinCEN and I was a treasury and um, really, you, you're one of the people who've been thinking about these issues uh, for a very, very long time in the, in the in the federal government. You know, the NSC or the National Security Council is, uh, I think, is probably a black box to a lot of folks who are not in the government or at least not sort of feeding into the process. Could you just describe a little bit about sort of what the National Security Council is and, and the work that you guys do across the interagency? Yeah, that's a great question uh, and an, an interesting way to, to describe us, I think. Um, so the National Security Council is the, the chief policy body for the White House in developing national security policy. So in, in the directorate, like where I work, the cybersecurity directorate, um, we are we are led by the deputy national security advisor for cyber and emerging technologies and Newberger. Uh, and we're working to try to identify the key national security policy equities related to cybersecurity um, and emerging technologies that are potentially posing threats or opportunities for leveraging in support of U.S. national security interests. Terrific. Thank you so much. 
Uh, Ken, I know on the law enforcement side, obviously, you've been thinking about these issues uh, for a long time, really leading teams uh, for HSI in the space. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your background and, and how you've gotten to this uh, this this space? Sure. <clears throat> My background is fairly eclectic. Uh, I was, as a young man, uh, in the first Gulf War as a sergeant in the Marine Corps with special operations. Uh, that was my first deployment overseas in a, in a combat role. Then I came back, got my degree, and I taught for high school chemistry for nine years. I actually have a master's in biochemistry. And after 9-11, I went back into the Navy as a naval officer, intelligence officer. And I uh, actually met a customs agent while we were in our training. And he basically seduced me to the dark side. So in 2005, I became... Um, what I thought was going to be a customs special agent, but at the time we transitioned to uh, uh, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. HSI is a branch of ICE that focuses primarily on investigative investigations in mostly financial, narcotics, and things of those nature. Basically, we are the customs investigators for the federal government now. Um, I've done that for 15 years. I spent my first 12 years as a, a narcotics and human trafficking investigator. I did my first cryptocurrency case in 2014 when, frankly, nobody in the agency really knew what the heck it was. Um, and so I, I was in on the very ground figuring out how we were going to manage this stuff. And being a victim of our own lack of policy, I had an investigation open on me because I had to seize the cryptocurrency in an account that I controlled because we didn't have a mechanism for it. So it's been quite a learning process. I have a couple of downrange deployments with the Navy special operations uh, related to terror finance, uh, human gathering, and other intelligence functions for the military. So that's my sort of base of operations. I have been the program manager now for two years here at HSI, where I basically designed the training and tool acquisition and technology acquisition for HSI as it relates to the cyber financial realm, which is essentially cryptocurrency and other related digital technologies. Ken, thank you so much. When I was uh, when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I was lucky enough to work with HSI in a lot of cases, and you guys really are tip of the spear on national security and protecting the homeland. And it's terrific to have you on talking about these topics uh, today, uh, Lisa. I think you were thinking about cyber and cybersecurity really before anybody. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your background and and how you sort of found yourself in this space? Of course, and you know it's interesting because so many of us come from disparate backgrounds. This really is still a nascent area. So uh, many of us in this field did something before in the before times. Um, so I came to this area from uh, from uh, the environmental space. I was an environmental lawyer for for a few years before I turned to this. In two thousand, I. Um, I asked the head of our technology team if I could do some technology work because I thought the internet was interesting and maybe it had legs, maybe it was here to stay. Uh, and uh, he said, no, thank you. You're not a corporate lawyer, but you might be interested in this regulatory area of privacy. And um, nobody was thinking cybersecurity at the time, of course, but I was fortunate enough to have, uh, have been called to get um, involved in some of the very early breaches. And Ken, you, you mentioned cryptocurrency starting in the 2012-13-ish. Uh, um, I, I worked on an extortion attempt back in 2006, I believe, and they uh, the threat actor asked for e-gold. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not even sure that exists anymore. Uh, so I, I got involved. I was really, really uh, very lucky to have been um called by clients to get involved in some of the very early breaches. And uh, we've worked now my team on uh, the biggest breach of all time, uh, as well as uh, I would say the most impactful um, breach to date. Uh, there, there will be more. So um, we, have, we have a team that is global. It's very important to be global in this space. And, uh, and it, it really has sort of grown up. Our team has grown up as uh, this area has evolved. Terrific. Thank you so much. And uh, Tom, uh, if you could just sort of walk us through um, your your background, how you sort of ended up in the intelligence space and and um, yeah, and, and your journey here. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Uh, I too, uh, similar uh, background, started in the military. I got my start in the US Navy as a cryptologic officer. 
And in, this was in the early days where they were starting out this new specialty called information warfare. Uh, so this was a lot of just thinking through, even from the Department of Defense, uh, what is cyber? How does this fit into uh, normal uh, DOD operations? Uh, so really had a, a front seat there uh, up at NSA and, and with what eventually became Cybercom, uh, stayed in that area for several years. So really got to see kind of the emergence of this discipline on the government side. Uh, in 2014, I moved over to the commercial side and moved over to PNC Bank. And there I oversaw the uh, cyber intel operations at the bank. And about five years ago, I had an opportunity uh, to come over to Flashpoint, which was a commercial intelligence provider where we provide a lot of support to the Fortune 500, uh, where we're helping understand what's happening in illicit communities, understanding different risks to organizations. And unfortunately, one of the big things that keeps us very busy is what brings us here today, which is this extortion economy, whether it's the data that's being stolen or networks being locked up or individual family members being targeted for activities that uh, someone's found online. Unfortunately, this brings us in where quite often we're helping clients understand how to deal with these actors, uh, if and when they want to engage uh, these actors, coming up with a plan for how you can get out of it uh, in a safe way. And sometimes it brings you into the world of cryptocurrency, which is really the, the currency uh, that really helps facilitate a lot of these engagements. And I know we'll go into this uh, more, but uh, along with Lisa, unfortunately, you get pulled into very high profile situations with um, uh, big big impacts on our global economy, big impacts on our critical infrastructure, and really uh, brings a whole new dynamic that I think a lot of people are just starting to understand what goes through decision makers' minds when they're dealing with these situations. So really thankful to be part of this conversation today and and looking forward to sharing some stories. Tom, thank you so much. You know, it's I'm like even more excited right now, sort of hearing this background and expertise for this discussion. Um, it's going to, going to be terrific, um, Carol. Let's let's start with you. You know, cyber attacks, ransomware, um, cybersecurity are not new issues. They're not new concerns. But somehow this moment feels unique. I think as we were sort of chatting earlier, uh, Lisa said something around like there's not a better time for this conversation, and it really does feel that way. Um, you know, there seems to be a shift in the way we're even thinking about national security based on sort of some recent attacks, Colonial Pipeline, JBS. Can you talk us through how sort of at the highest levels of government, um, you know, in the NSC, in the White House, uh, you're thinking about the response to this evolving threat? Definitely. Um, I think it really speaks to a lot of the issues and the real disruptive impacts that uh, that you were mentioning, like, for example, uh, in the JPS uh, foods and the um, in the colonial pipeline incident. Uh, it really highlights the increasing scale and sophistication of the ransomware threat as well. And the, the White House uh, at, the, at the highest levels recognizes this as a national security threat. And you're seeing that manifest either in the president's own engagements with President Putin, as well as um, with the, the launch of interagency initiatives like rewards for justice out of the Department of State and an upcoming FinCEN exchange and the launch of StopRansomware.gov. So um, I, I think what, what you're probably seeing is the whole of government response in recognizing Recognizing that there's a need to address both the cyber and the financial aspects of this cyber enabled extortion sort of ecosystem. So we're approaching it uh, on a four pronged approach, really uh, focusing on on disrupting key ransomware networks and facilitators that are supporting this activity, um, including through enhancing reporting of the activity, uh, building resilience, uh, exploring incentives that can be used to drive improved cyber hygiene to help us better defend against these attacks and mitigate the significance of their impact, um, combating the misuse of cryptocurrency, uh, working with international partners to enhance anti-money laundering controls being put in place in jurisdictions that are being leveraged through jurisdictional arbitrage by illicit actors, um, and then also through building our own analytic and industry partnership capabilities uh, to support um, tracing and recovery efforts of ransomware proceeds. And then finally, really building that international coalition for support on capacity building and holding nations accountable who harbor these criminals. What's uh, what's so extraordinary about that answer 
is you kind of have their perspective across the interagency. We're seeing a lot sort of in patchwork, you know, you know, the, you have the attorney general reaching out to U.S. attorney's offices and making sure that they're coordinating these cases the same as, as terrorism cases. And you see, as you mentioned, sort of FinCEN sort of doing their work in, as a regulator. But I think what you guys are doing is really seeing that high level perspective of where how it all fits in, which is which is really extraordinary sort of. You know, Ken, feeding into that a little bit, because you're sort of one of the pieces that that feed in here, right, into that interagency, um, you know, and obviously DHS charged with protecting uh, the homeland, and you are the law enforcement piece of that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how DHS and really particularly HSI is is thinking about this threat and feeding into the interagency? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I kind of want to point out for those of us that are old enough to remember, if you remember back to the 2000 scare, when all of the systems were going to crash because the date code was going to change from the 19s to the 2000s and all the computers were going to think they were 100 years old and all that. And it was like this big deal. And we thought the world was going to end. I would say that we're kind of at that place with technology today in terms of just how ubiquitous these types of control technologies that manage systems are within our infrastructure. And so we're really vulnerable in this space because most so much of our infrastructure is digital now and controlled by these systems and they're vulnerable to being hacked and therefore it's a source of revenue. And, and I can tell you, we work literally on the front lines. I can give you a couple of case examples, recent case examples where we um, explain this. We had a, 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 an elementary school. So what the bad guys are doing is they're actually scraping the internet and finding vulnerable networks. And then they sell those vulnerable networks just like they sell PII on the dark net. And then a hacker will buy that information and then hack into that device, engage in a ransomware program, and then and attempt to get paid via cryptocurrency. So a couple of things in that. We actually proactively, we have folks working in this space as well. We will proactively purchase those vulnerability statements, reach out to the organization um, that's vulnerable and help them to go through their systems to plug those holes. Um, in this particular case, they hadn't updated some of their server software, and so they had a vulnerability in their server systems that would have allowed a hacker to basically lock their systems up. And you're, when you're talking about schools, hospitals, police departments, these are areas of vulnerability that are of significance. And so we will proactively, using our undercover assets and other capabilities, identify these vulnerabilities and work to, to either take them off the market and or plug them up so they're not vulnerabilities anymore. That's one example. We talk about this in the dark net as well. Cryptocurrency, and again, most of the studies are showing that most cryptocurrency transactions are legitimate in nature. Only about 1% to 2% are likely illicit in nature. But they are very good at facilitating, in particular, dark net transactions and ransomware transactions because of the the ability to move large amounts of money fairly quickly overseas, where once they kind of go overseas, it becomes far more challenging to get it back versus in a, on U.S. exchanges. So uh, we had a, a case uh, with Hamas, actually my partner um, in my group right now who just came over to us was the case agent in that case where we targeted Hamas. We actually did an intrusion on their systems, shut down their website, and then seized their cryptocurrency by hacking into their, their um, wallets. And so we're really working the problem on the front end proactively to try to prevent the attacks. And when the attacks do, do take place, we're working on the back end to recover the funds and shut down the operators that are engaged in those type of activities. Um, that's kind of where HSI is, is really focused its energies and efforts as a law enforcement. Um, sort of, as you say, the tip of the spear, and that's really what the tip of the spear does. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's 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 really terrific. Sort of, Lisa, building on that, because um, I think that's that's amazing to have the policy perspective, plus sort of how law enforcement is actually engaging in these sorts of investigations and these sorts of cases. Um, would you walk us through sort of how, you, how your involvement begins and sort of walk us through your engagement in what in a cybersecurity breach. I know that you're sort of on the you know you're, you're dealing in the in a reactive and proactive way. Let's sort of talk first about react your reactive engagement. You know, there's a breach. How 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 do you, how do you and your firm getting get involved? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're right. The conversation does does flow nicely. Um, and I I just want to say to Carol and Ken, 
that Tom and I are standing behind you with our cheerleader pom poms, and we're we're hoping that you're super oh. successful. <laughs> Um, so how, how do, um, how does council get involved when there is an anomaly detected that, um, rises to a certain level, uh, high or, or, or critical level, uh, then typically the incident response team will convene and the general counsel of the company will call council. Um, council then will get the experts involved. We try to protect uh, what we can, what's appropriate to protect uh, through attorney client and work product privilege. And so we will engage the forensic investigator, we will engage the ransom negotiator, assuming it's ransomware, uh, and then kick off uh, the investigation. And the, um, the forensic investigator will be looking to figure out where the vulnerabilities are in the system, uh, wants, will want to patch those vulnerabilities quickly, We'll look for attribution. We'll try to figure out who is the the bad guy here uh, and we'll help us understand the modus operandi of of the particular threat actor. And then of course, we'll move on to restoring and rebuilding uh, the system. Um, The ransom negotiator at the same time is starting the discussion with the threat actor. And um, we tend to start discussions regardless of an intent to actually pay. Uh, because it gives us, it buys us time. So we we get to delay any kind of, uh, of uh, real adverse action on the part of the threat actor. And of course, these days, um, the uh, ransomware actors are not content with just bricking systems. They first exfiltrate um, a significant amount of data and then brick systems in this double extortion attempt that we now are, are very familiar with. Um, so we are we are trying to put off the moment uh, at which the in, the threat actor is going to start posting our data, and we're going to try to find out what data they have, and whether in fact they can decrypt our data. Is this the appropriate threat actor that we're negotiating with? And if we can buy some time, we'll know whether we can in fact um, rebuild our systems. Do we have good backups, good clean backups that we can use to rebuild? Uh, to restore our systems? Do we need to rebuild them from scratch? Are these critical systems or not critical systems such that we can move on without buying a decryptor? Um, so that is all going on in tandem. And it's, you know, we, we describe it in a very linear fashion, but nothing about this is linear. Um, it's all happening really simultaneously and, and we're managing multiple work streams uh, at once. We're also thinking about the stakeholders. Um, who are who are the relevant business partners here? Are the employees uh, at issue? We, we certainly need to manage our employee population. We may need to manage uh, customers. So often we'll bring a, in a third party communications firm as well um, to help us. And uh, and I neglected, of course, to say that very early on in this process, we're going to notify uh, law enforcement. Um, I am very bullish on notifying law enforcement. I think um, I think uh, some of our, our government folks are just fantastic. And uh, this wasn't true in the mid 2000s um, when there was everybody was sort of scrambling to figure out well, what the heck is this? What's going on? But now there is such a high level of sophistication from our government partners. And um, it's just been uh, such a pleasure getting assistance um, from from our government partners. Um, so. One other thing that I want to mention is now that we have, um, and this is this is just ubiquitous now, exfiltration um, uh, in the mix. Just about in just about every uh, ex, every every ransomware that we've been involved in recently, um, we have to think about breach notification uh, because it may be that um, individuals' uh, personal information was compromised or. Um, sensitive business information belonging to other companies was compromised. So we may have contractual obligations and we likely have uh, duties under the U.S. breach notification laws, and there are 54 of them, 50 states plus Guam, U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and D.C., uh, that require us to notify affected individuals if their sensitive personal personal information was, uh, was accessed or acquired by the threat actor. So all of this is happening at once and uh, we go off and manage the different work streams and the different silos and hopefully come together once or twice a day to share information. So we're all uh, running in the same direction. 
That was amazing. I think we do think so much about sort of the policy perspective and maybe less about sort of how this actually plays itself out in real time and how we engage or how companies engage folks like you. Tom, this is another, again, like a great jumping off point because you fit that what Lisa just, the process Lisa just described, you are right in the middle of. Can you sort of walk us through how you and Flashpoint, what role you and Flashpoint play in that reactive process uh, when a breach occurs? Sure. Yeah. I think, uh, first of all, I want to echo what Lisa said. Like we are really cheering for Ken and and Carol to be super successful because I want to be put out of the ransomware business. None of us like being in in this. And, and, uh, when it comes to prevention, that's what we're all trying to, to really help clients understand. So, uh, if we do a lot of work to help under people understand how to protect your networks and understand how, the basic um, cyber hygiene, if you get that implemented, you can prevent a lot of these attacks. That being said, we do get pulled in where doing the basics is not always easy. And unfortunately, it impacts the the largest organizations down to the small uh, and medium-sized businesses as well. When these types of events occur, as Lisa highlighted, when a victim is going through that decision-making process of, okay, I had this event, there's a ransom or some of my data was stolen. How do I want to approach this? Uh, Ideally, this is something that uh, companies have a plan in place and have been through this and they know who they're going to call and they know who the the key decision-makers will be. Uh, But if they don't have that, uh, you can pull in different Uh, People who have a lot of experience in this space, and that's where someone like Flashpoint will come in, where we can help uh, give sense about who this group is, past engagements with the specific ransomware group, what you can expect the negotiation process to look like, uh, and then really think through what is it you're trying to achieve. Quite often, I think a lot of people uh, don't understand. They think it's just very straightforward of here's a ransom, I just need to pay it, and I get things back. It's actually much more complicated than that. And what we're trying to do is help people understand the different options that they have in front of them. Uh, if they choose any one path, uh, how they can keep their other options open where you may want to, as Lisa said, start that negotiation just to get the other actor talking to understand what they have. Because sometimes you learn that they might not even understand what exactly they have. We've had situations where the group has stolen highly valuable information they didn't know what they had. So uh, actually the ransom amount that they had was so so low that it was very clear to us they didn't know the value of the data that they stole. So part of the approach of what we were doing was trying to come up with a plan for how do we minimize the focus on the actual data that was stolen so we can uh, get through this in a successful manner. And uh, this is where it's a lot of, of discussions and understanding what was stolen, what was critical, what's in that data, do you need that restored, uh, how quickly do you need those decryption keys, are there critical systems, are there a manufacturing plant uh, or uh, in a hospital where you the speed of recovery is more important than the price or more important than anything else. So all of these uh, factors are at play. And as Lisa said, all these situations, they they kind of follow the same general blueprint, but they're all unique just because every business is so unique and and what's how they were impacted, what's been stolen, really um, it really plays out with uh, how you want to respond. So when uh, we're going through that, we're trying to present these different options where uh, the victim can best understand the path forward. They understand the different courses of action, what the likely outcome will be. And we develop a plan for how we're going to go through that. And uh, as Lisa says, part of that is also when you want to talk to law enforcement. I have never been part of a situation where law enforcement or any government entity has been a, a negative impact. It's always been very positive. They've been super helpful. They're there to support the victims. They give great insights. They can give some uh, general uh, uh, guidance about what they've seen other victims do. and it. It is something that we highly, highly encourage. And if we get to the point where uh, for a a variety of reasons that a victim decides that they want to pay, this is something where we can go out to these uh, different crypto markets and it's very easy to get multiple millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin or these privacy coins that like Monero, you can get millions of dollars there in a relatively 
uh, in a couple hours. It's not a long process. And this is something that I know we'll talk about. It's the speed and uh, and the liquidity of these crypto markets that's helping really fuel some of the uh, challenges that we have in front of us. Uh, there's no simple answers, uh, but through all this, really what we're trying to do is just help people understand what happens, how this occurs, if it does occur, what are your different options, what are the different things that you should be considering along the way. And really what we're trying to do is, is get that business or, or that individual back into operations so they can get back to their, their normal business. And unfortunately, this is just a, a situation that's impacting more and more companies around the world. And um, or we go back to where we started. We are definitely cheering for government to uh, help solve a solution and, and uh, bring the public and private sectors together. Terrific. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a couple questions in a moment about sort of the the proactive approach or what your clients can be doing before sort of an event occurs. But l- let me jump to to Carol uh, quickly here. You know, I would be. I think Tom hit on crypto a little bit, and um, you know, I know now you wear sort of a much broader hat in terms of cyber and ransomware in this whole world. But I I, I literally have my cryptocurrency policy go-to person on on the TRM talk. So I'm going to ask you some crypto questions. Um, you know, crypto is the form of payment here, right? But sort of, can you can you walk us through a little bit sort of what role crypto plays? Uh, you see lots of conversations on the Hill and elsewhere around crypto in these in these attacks, in these cases. And I would love to kind of get your your perspective on on, on the role crypto plays. Yeah, um, it's, it's a complicated role, of course, but like any technology or any payment system, and in this case, a tech, like fueled and tech-based payment system, it can be exploited or leveraged for good based on its design and the, the vulnerabilities that are built in or secured. Um, and I, I think that it's impossible to, um, to ignore the fact that these decentralized payments that allow for immediate cross-border transfer uh, in a peer-to-peer manner that allow for some of the, the suit the pseudonymity of cash combined with the the immediacy of a wire transfer, but not necessarily bookended with regulated financial institutions, this environment has allowed for and and enabled the rise of sophisticated cybercrime economies. Um, However, I I will state that I don't think that that inherently states that there's anything um, uh, illicit or evil about the technology at all. Um, Typically, that's resultant from um, inadequacy of regulatory regimes existing in international jurisdictions to ensure that financial systems um, and the associated risks with them for money laundering and terrorist financing are properly mitigated, um, or just not building in the kinds of controls that typically exist in financial systems and for good reasons. So I think that there is really great and incredible innovative potential um, from cryptocurrency. Um, I do think that a that an, an insufficiency of considering the kinds of controls that need to be built in, whether it's considerations for revocability or sanction screening, um, or just understanding how identity should should and must be playing a role in the financial system, but in a privacy preserving way, but also a lawful discoverability by the authorities that really need to understand who is on the other side of a transaction. Um, I think that there is great potential for working with industry. And I know m- many of the speakers and yourself spoke to the importance of international national and industry partnerships here. That's really where I think that our expectation um, and expectation from the Hill, even though there's uh, certainly lots of different perspectives on the best way to engage in in regulation of cryptocurrency, there's a desire to enhance that visibility and reporting with industry and to figure out what the right controls are, whether governance or protocol or network layer controls or application layer controls. I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to work with the cryptocurrency sector, um, uh, as well as like great transparency that can potentially come from these assets as well. That is so beautifully stated. I mean, I, I think it's really interesting. We're seeing that just now, but, but we're pre-first inning, right, in terms of what a clear regulatory framework is going to look like for crypto. And we see a number of bills on the Hill the last few weeks and a number of hearings and and obviously FinCEN and FATF and others are regulating or trying to regulate in the space. But it's... Uh, it's very early days. And I think to your point, we're probably going to need something in place to really address some of these issues. Ken, um, just sort of following on that, obviously you're thinking a lot about how to mitigate illicit finance risks in cryptocurrency. Can you talk a little bit about how you're um, sort of leading um, that effort um, at HSI? Absolutely, but I I do wanna piggyback on what Carol said. One of the biggest struggles we have as a law enforcement entity is 
the lack of firm legal definitions for what cryptocurrencies and these digital transfer mediums are. Like, for example, in the U.S., cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is considered property. But in many other countries, it's considered a form of currency. And so it's regulated differently. And oftentimes when we write um, a search warrant or um, a seizure warrant in the U.S., even if we have a mutual legal assist, an MLAT agreement with the country we're sending it to, if we write our documents like it's property and we send it to a country where it's currency, they won't accept it because we're not defining what we're seizing correctly. And so there's a ton of challenges in this area that arise from the lack of a good legal definition for what these things are and good regulations associated with that. And I, that's something that is going to have to come from the international community because Bottom line is like pretty much for the first time in our lifetimes, you've basically made it a small world because you can move crypto from one side of the globe to the other about as hard as it is to hand it to your neighbor next door. And so we're really we're shrinking the uh, the world down in terms of the ability to move value from place to place. And that that's a significant hurdle that we have. And, and I think it's going to take a lot of dialogue and conversations to really move that ball forward. I think, I think to your point, I mean, so really what you're seeing almost like what you're describing is diff, almost like different regulators and different, frankly, law enforcement entities trying to come up with their own definition for what it is for the purposes of search warrant or seizure warrant. Right. We really don't yet have sort of a cohesive legislative definition um, and are sort of working working through that. I see Carol nodding her head. Do you want to jump in here? I was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I come from FinCEN, so of course I'm going to defend the existing U.S. Re like regulatory framework that it all it's all based on context and the the interesting and transformative nature of these assets defined by software. Like a token can represent anything, which includes any kind of economic function. And now you have a system where these assets can be used both as a medium of exchange and currency, as well as potentially operate as a security or a derivative. Um, so it's it's a really interesting space that makes, I think, determining regulatory applicability um, potentially difficult. But uh, I'll just state that I appreciate that the US framework has been tech and form neutral and basically stating that where the same economic function occurs, um, that they'll try to apply, th that they are applying the same regulatory framework. Um, so I, I do think that there's been a lot of benefits to a tech neutral framework. I know that that's not the approach that every jurisdiction is taking. Um, so I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, the U.S. regulatory framework, which I think has helped the U.S. be one of the really the leading and most comprehensive regulatory framework for, for digital assets around the globe. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I knew you'd have us on this. So I, uh, I want to make sure you got that in. Ken, I, I do want to stay with you for a minute, though, and sort of talk about the way HSI is thinking about, um, you know, stopping illicit finance or mitigating illicit finance in cryptocurrencies, um, particularly in sort of the ransomware context, but really writ large. Actually, it's really a kind of a three, three prong approach. One is we want to prevent the use of it in illicit activity. When it is used in illicit activity, we want to be able to track it, trace it, and potentially recover it. And then we want on the back end to also be able to do some types of attribution and identification of individuals that are engaged in these activities. And so to do those things, we really, we got to have the right tools. So tool acquisition is a big part of my job. We go out, we test out the different analytical tools that are out there for blockchain analytics so that we can do a lot of these things. Um, the other thing is, as an organization, we have to work to train our field agents to identify and work in this space. This is a, a fairly technical space. And I can tell you that just from our perspective, COVID has accelerated the use of cryptocurrency and illicit activity, I think maybe three to five years ahead of schedule. I think we're seeing criminal organizations that probably wouldn't have adopted it at this point, having done so because of the restrictions that COVID put on the ability, to, for example, to do bulk cash smuggling or to have access to other financial institutions. And so there's been a, a push forward in terms of adoption, which I think has, has forced us to push forward as well. The other thing that we're doing is, is um, technology acquisition and software development in conjunction with organizations such as yours, where we're actually identifying investigative needs and then trying to create software and programs that can address those needs in a, in a somewhat automated fashion. The bottom line is, is one of the big hallmarks of crypto is it's very data heavy. 
And an example I give in my trainings is in the old days, if you had somebody who was smurfing and layering money for a cartel, you know, he could visit maybe 10, maybe if he was really industrious, maybe 15 banks a day, and he's limited to nine or ten thousand dollars worth of transactions for each visit. So he's laundering maybe a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars a day by by placement and layering. In cryptocurrency, that same guy can sit on his couch in his underwear and do a hundred thousand transactions in an hour, encapsulating literally millions of dollars. And so, what cryptocurrency That's has a allowed? Terrible visual, is- by the way, Ken. Just I, <laughs> I pictured what you were saying as you were saying it. So you know. <laughs> but bottom line is, is, is this is a data management problem. Among all the other challenges that we face in the space, we're, de- we're dealing now with large volumes of data that have to be analyzed and worked through and, and acquiring technologies and machine learning that allows us to do that and screen out for the illicit actors, identify them preemptively and go after them is something that we're working towards. But those technologies, like I said, are, are challenging and this is a difficult space to work in. No, terrific. Thank you so much. You know, um, quite honestly, you guys have, you know, overcome my master moderating uh, and answered, I think, a lot of the other topics I have uh, to hit with you guys. But one one that I would like to get back to is this idea of sort of proactive, um, the proactive support. Um, you know, Tom, how are you advising um, clients in the space in terms of, um, you know, cyber hygiene, as you as you described it? And Lisa, I'd love you to jump in on this as well. Yeah, it's a, a big part. It, it's conversations like this, which is the most important. It's getting business leaders to start understanding these different risks to their enterprise and helping them ask better questions to their security staff to ask better questions when they're going through different audits to make sure that uh, it's not just a check the box of do, do we have a certain technology installed, but it's actually have we tested it? Do we have backups? Have we gone through um, different scenarios? Have we done tabletop exercises? And that's, to me, one of the, the biggest things that we've seen really help organizations, especially the, the C-suite and the board of directors, where we actually have this conversation and, and walk through, like, what would you do in this situation? Uh, what, who's going to be making the, the calls? Who's going to be on the PR side? Who's responding there? Uh, and once you start to understand that this is not necessarily a cybersecurity uh, event, while that that may have have instigated the response, it very quickly escalates, and it, it's a much bigger uh, business wide uh, discussion, where it's typically the CEO or the CFO who are making these decisions. And for us, it's getting them uh, really comfortable with understanding what this topic is. What are the better questions that they can be asking? That helps them influence the different budgets and how they're uh, they're allocating uh, appropriate budgets to make sure that they have the right controls and the right procedures in place. And then after all that, we also work with the actual network defenders. And in that sense, this is where it really is technical. It's helping them exactly what Ken laid out before. How do these attackers operate? Where do they get this information? We can show people those underground uh, networks where they're selling all these accesses and it happens on a daily basis. And once you show people exactly how that operates, what their exposure is, they can better develop the plans for how they're going to remediate and be much more proactive with how they respond. Uh, we always say if the the first time you're thinking about ransomware is when you have the 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 note pop up on your screen that's saying your systems are locked up. Well, you missed about 10 different steps in advance of, of how these attackers uh, got to you. And there are a lot of different ways in which you can do those simple things to uh, protect against 90% of these attacks. Uh, I think you always hear it's it's the patch management. Make sure that uh, credentials that are stolen as they're being sold, that you have eyes on these different networks. It's making sure that uh, your employees understand what phishing is, how to detect it. Most importantly, who do, who do you report to? Uh, back when I was at the bank, that was the most important thing we did. It was educating employees of the proper way to notify. And it only takes one person to notify that there's a phishing campaign underway. And it gets your security folks really focused in on the right thing. So these are the things from the, the protection. It, it really, to me, starts with the education 
once you understand the ecosystem and what you're operating in, then you can understand which questions you need to ask and which controls you need to put in place. And there, uh, that's actually uh, a little bit easier um, in some sense, because there are technologies, there are different uh, services that are there to support companies in this regard. And uh, this is where we spend a lot of time really just having this conversation we're having here today. Terrific. Uh, Lisa, I saw you beaming through most of that. So I'm, assu- I'm assuming there's, there's a lot of agreement there, but sort of how are you advising clients, uh, you know, around, around sort of what time just described? Yeah, I'm, I'm nodding vigorously. Yes. <laughs> we, we've been preaching to the choir for two decades. We've been preaching not to the choir for two decades now on uh, cyber preparedness. It was only really in around 2013 that I think was, was the line in the sand when both senior management and boards started to really focus on this area and they didn't understand it. It's hard. It's technical. Um, it's daunting if you don't um, understand technology at all. Uh, and of course, you don't need to understand technology, really. You need to understand what this threat is all about. And as Tom said, ask the right questions. So now the focus is on making sure that we have really strong state-of-the-art incident response plans in place. We have an incident response team. They know what their roles and responsibilities are. We have practiced. We've done tabletop exercises, doing doing them once or twice or four times a year uh, with in different areas, maybe uh, technological deep dives, a comms tabletop exercise, a legal tabletop exercise, all very important to do. Bringing these teams together. Um, to discuss the hard issues in advance, as Tom said, do we, do we not, do we pay, do we not pay? Of course, um, the key thing is to remain nimble, right? You can't, um, you can't really uh, have something set in stone when you don't know what the threat is. You can't make these decisions in a vacuum. Um, of course, the, the technical aspects that Tom mentioned, um, complex passwords, uh, multi-factor authentication, all of those are so critical. Um, but then also uh, more of the administrative piece like a vendor management program. Vendors are such a huge source of vulnerability um, now to companies. We need to manage our vendors very carefully. We need to do due diligence in advance of retaining them. Are they capable of providing the safeguards that we think they should provide? Do we have appropriate and strong contractual protections? And do we do ongoing monitoring? Uh, of our of our vendors, that's that's very important. And the final uh, thing that I'll mention is the the ultimate backstop to all of this is cyber insurance. Um, and do we have the appropriate cyber insurance in place? Terrific. Yeah. No. Thank you so much. I, I think one thing I knew I was probably going to need a lot more time for this extraordinary group, and uh, I see that I am running out. But uh, you know, something we we tend to do at TRM talks is we bust out the crystal ball. Uh, so I would love to kind of get your perspectives on what's next. I mean, things seem to be literally moving at the speed of the internet um, at the moment in this space, whether it's on the Hill or whether it's um, in a, in these actual um, attacks. Ken, why don't I start with you sort of what's next or what sort of top of mind at the moment that you kind of see as uh, in, you know an emerging threat or something that you're going to be thinking a lot about in the coming weeks, months, you know, up to a year? That's a that's a really interesting question, and kind of the way I want to want to paint this is is we'll talk about, for example, if you were to get mugged on the street, right, and the bad guy asks you for your wallet, and of course we would teach you to comply. Now you've got what in your wallet? You've got cash. You've got credit cards. You've got your driver's license, which has your home address on it. There's all this information in that thing that the bad guy's taken that he can now exploit. And so in the old days, when somebody mugged you, they took your cash and that was it. In today's cyber world, when they mug you, they have so many avenues to attack you. It's not just, oh, I took your data or, oh, I locked your systems or, oh, I got PII on your employees or your customers. It's it's all of these things that now can be exploited for profit. And these organizations have become really good and very sophisticated in being able to exploit all those different data sources. So as HSI, our focus is primarily on prevention. And one of the biggest ways we do that is outreach to the, to the private sector, going out to companies, and we do this, and training our agents to go out to companies in their local AOR to talk to them about their 
their hygiene, their cyber hygiene, their um, what technologies they're using, what kind of vulnerabilities they have, and how they can basically make themselves as invulnerable as possible. This is not a hundred percent equation, but the the harder you make yourself as a target in this area, the less likely you are to be targeted. And one of the biggest ways that you can help yourself is to not be too vocal about things that you've got going on in your life. For example, if you're walking through a, a bad area, you don't want to wear your you know, $50,000 Rolex and have your diamond rings on and all that stuff because you're just, you're advertising your wealth to the bad guys and they're more likely to target you. And companies will do this too. They will advertise their wealth or something cool that they're doing that will kind of put them on the radar of the bad guys. And I'm going to tell you, if you're in the digital space and you're managing valuable data, that automatically makes you a target. So I can tell you governments, police departments, hospitals, schools on the government side, absolutely those are areas that are that are a high value targets because of the data that they hold. But companies do the same thing. Credit card companies have all kinds of PII. I mean, and, and so they're they're naturally vulnerable. And so HSI is working to basically bolster the proactive defenses that these companies engage in by engaging with the companies and talking them through the process. Also on the back end, working in the crypto space to identify actors in the space, working on the dark net markets, working in cyberspace to proactively identify the illicit actors that are out there and go after them proactively in terms of targeting what they're doing and either using attribution in our tools to identify them and then go after them. Unfortunately, one of the big challenges in all of this is a lot of these folks are not in the United States. And I want to second what Carol said. Our laws are probably the best in the world, but the problem is the rest of the world doesn't follow our laws. And crypto, unfortunately, better than anything else, you can work as easily in a foreign country as you can in the US. That's not true with cash. Like I can't, I'd have to fly to a foreign country to put cash in the bank. I could put crypto in an exchange overseas instantly the same way I would put it in a U.S. exchange. So unfortunately, these bad actors can live outside the U.S. and work outside the U.S. and circumvent a lot of our laws in furtherance of their criminal activities. And so that's a big challenge for us. And we are working with our foreign partners. Look, we're going to Panama in a month to train their investigators on how to do advanced cryptocurrency analytics. We're doing the we're doing we're not just working in the US, we're working with our international partners to bolster their capabilities because bringing them up to speed is going to make it harder for those actors to act overseas as well. And so these are areas of endeavor for HSI. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. Lisa, I know you have a hard stop. So if you want to drop the mic and jump, you are welcome to. Um what 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 do you what do you see out there as you're sort of advising clients? What are the emerging threats uh here? You know, uh, from my perspective, um, what I see is that boards and and uh, and management consider this to be the top risk issue for companies. Um, we have seen uh, CEOs resign. We have seen boards threatened with ouster. Uh, so it, it the level of concern is as high as it can get within organizations. Um, I think the the key issue that I'm hearing is that we have to stop as a society fighting yesterday's battles in this space, and we need to figure out proactively how to determine what tomorrow's battle is going to be and stop it uh, before it occurs. Terrific. Thanks so much. Uh, similarly, Tom, what how, how, what are sort of the emerging threats and sort of the intelligence space out there, and what are you how, how is Flashpoint thinking about these? Yeah, it's building on what Lisa just said. Uh, while a lot of our focus today has been about cyber criminals and how they've used relatively uh, not highly sophisticated technologies to really have these huge impacts, what we're starting to see and worry about is uh, as nation states step into this space, we've already seen that Iran has used uh, ransomware attacks against Israel for geopolitical aims. We've seen uh, recent indictments that highlighted there were Chinese espionage actors who were moonlighting, uh, it seems like, for ransomware objectives. And this brings a whole different uh, dimension into what we're going to be dealing with in the future, where you don't know it. We assume it's always a cyber criminal group. But what happens when it's not a cyber criminal group? What happens when it is a much more sophisticated actor 
using really cyber crime as a front to achieve some other objective. And that's something that I think uh, we're starting to see uh, more and more entrance in the space when it comes to this threat. Yeah, that's incredibly well said. I think combining sort of Ken's, you know, mugging at unprecedented speed and scale with your, you know, nation state actors, um, programmatic money laundering, you know, uh, cyber attacks at the speed of the internet. I think that that's why this is such an enormous threat because you have all part, all, all different pieces of the spectrum. Carol, I saved you for last because this is what you do, right? You guys sort of, you reach out to interagency, you bring on partners, private, public, and you really try to anticipate where is that we need, where do we need good policy and where do we need to empower law enforcement to sort of meet emerging threats? Um, what does your crystal ball say in terms of, of, of issues that you're thinking about now? Yeah, um, I, I, I definitely uh, agree with this premise that ransomware is not going to be fixed. It's not like flipping a light switch. It's going to take time and very, very hard work and a lot of people taking ownership of, um, of implementing a lot of the controls um, and taking up the mantle on things that they really haven't previously taken responsibility for. Um, and that really speaks to, I think, the, the criticality of working with industry. Um, right now, I think a lot of the trends that Lisa and Tom especially have spoken to um, are because of a recognition of the disruptive impact that is inherently what ransomware is. It's not just, you know, um, theft of intellectual property that will eventually have an economic impact on the company, which is devastating, but it's immediately impactful and disruptive of critical functions um, and services that, that are devastating to businesses. So I think that that recognition um, will hopefully drive um, industry to be recognizing that you are on the forefront of this issue. You are the ones being targeted. You are the ones whose infrastructure is being exploited. You're the ones providing compliance services, whose financial institution um, the money is moving through, or you're the ones administering these currencies and have the opportunity to figure out how to build in the kinds of controls that would facilitate revocability of illicitly identified transactions so that we can like starve the ecosystem, the criminal ecosystem of their ill-gotten gains. There is, there is just great opportunity for working with industry. Um, and I think that the government is focusing on not, not just how there are certain responsibilities that potentially should be imposed or enforced, but also how we can enable industry in fulfilling their mission set um, and figuring out what we can do to help support you all. So I think that's going to be a really critical focus for us. Um, we'll also continue to focus on moderni modernizing federal networks, implementing a lot of the controls that Tom and Lisa spoke to are the same ones uh, that we issued in our EO for federal networks to implement and help to secure software vulnerabilities um, for, for software that's purchased by the U.S. government. Uh, and continuing to work to defend critical infrastructure, like under our industrial control system initiative. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, that is an amazing way to end this and actually an extremely positive note, which is shocking for like sort of this, this issue. Um, so sort of, you know, how, how, how can we work on this together? Um, thank you so much uh, to the audience. We are not going to be able to have time to uh, take questions today, but um, feel free to send us or put one in the chat and uh, we can address it uh, in writing at a later date. Um, and thank you guys all so much, uh, so much for joining me. Um, it was just an, an absolutely awesome uh, conversation. Uh, TRM Talks is brought to you by TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software. Our mission is to build a safer financial system for billions of people. Looking forward to another terrific discussion next month with movers and shakers from the cryptocurrency space. Until then, thank you to all of you who work so hard to keep us safe.